So thanks to everybody who came out to the new school tonight um, to join us for this Do the Math premiere. And thanks to all of you back at home, sitting in your living rooms and church basements um, and libraries and everywhere around the country and around the world. Um, thank you for joining us. We've got a great panel tonight. Um, we'll probably take about um, 30, 45 minutes and um, talk about a lot of the themes that uh, we saw in the film. And um, we'll be collecting comments online. If you tweet or Facebook or send us an email, uh, tag it hashtag Earth Night. Um, and, if you, and the folks here at the Tishman Auditorium have handed in their questions via um, index card. So I'm gonna just quickly introduce our panelists here. Um, on the far end is Dr. James Hansen, um, top client sci climate scientist. Um, He's an adjunct professor at Columbia University, and thanks for joining us. Um, we've got Sophie Laysoff, from, a sophomore at NYU, um, who's helping lead the NYU divestment movement. Um, and we have Hannah Milnes uh, from Uptown, um, who's part of the Barnard Columbia Divest Coalition. And, uh, She's a first year at Columbia. Um, and via Skype from somewhere, where are you, Bill? I'm in Vermont. I'm at home. Oh. Via, via Skype from Vermont um, is Bill McKibben, writer, activist, and co-founder of 350.org. So Bill, why don't we start with you? Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, where we are right now after the film, and how you're feeling about all of this. Well, sure. And let me apologize first for not being there in person. I literally can't stand to watch myself on the screen. Um, it just is almost physically impossible. So I, for once in my life, stayed home for a little while. Um, and it feels really good to be home, but it, I miss being there with you all. And uh, especially getting to see not only our two uh, great divestment activists, but getting to congratulate uh, uh, our, our oldest friend and guru, Jim Hansen, on the occasion of his retirement after uh, more than four decades at NASA. Uh, retirement <laughs> and uh, uh, I think he'll, I'm afraid, I, if I were the fossil fuel industry, I'd be worried because I think he's going to be even more dangerous, uh, unleashed from, uh, from NASA. Um, uh, where we are right now, well, look, let me first of all say uh, happy Earth Night to everybody. I'm thinking a lot today about two people in particular, uh, about Tim DeChristopher, who got released from federal custody today after 18 months and about um, Sandra Steingraber, who's in jail in upstate New York for the next uh, 10 days or so, uh, fighting fracking up there. There's other people in jail with her, and there's other people in jail all over the country now. Every day, someplace around this country, there are people figuring out new ways to stand up. When, when we launched, we launched this Do the Math thing, because I wrote this piece in Rolling Stone, and it went so crazily viral that we figured we should do what, you know, do what we can with this. And we did this roadshow that you saw some of the footage of, and many thanks to Jared and his crew for their amazing work. I've seen enough of it um, to know just how great, what a great job they've done. And they've done this job before on other moments in this fight. They've become the real chroniclers of, of this struggle. Um, but we did that Do the Math Tour, and where we are right now is we've got... 340-some campuses that are fighting hard now with, uh, for divestment. We have four campuses that have already done the right thing. We have what the Nation magazine said was the fastest growing student movement in several decades, and it's growing so fast that it's crossed right out of colleges into cities and towns. There's big active divestment fights. We'll have some big news in the course of the next week. The city of Seattle's already divested. It's crossed into lots of religious denominations, and it's crossed the ocean. 
Uh, we're hearing from Europeans uh, where colleges are taking this up. We found out earlier this week that the biggest denomination in Australia uh, just divested in the last couple of days. Um, it's really exciting to see it happen and to see uh, not only now that it's sort of us raising this math, but that the math in the last few months has been confirmed by the International Energy Agency and the World Bank and, and lots of others. That's all the good news. The bad news is, you know, the temperature keeps going up and uh, the Arctic keeps melting. And uh, it's not like we're winning this fight, but it sure as hell is like we're fighting this fight now. And for me, that feels really good on this Earth Day, a lot better than it felt even a year ago. Thanks, Bill. So, Dr. Hansen, you've been... Uh, running climate models for years and years and years. Um, can you tell us a little bit about where we are with the science right now and what it's telling us? Well, uh, yeah, the science uh, is really very simple. Uh, and that's actually what makes the story scary. The fact, if you, there are just two or three pieces of information that you need to know and which there is absolutely no disagreement about. One of them is the inertia of the climate system. When we, or nature, applies forces to the climate system, it doesn't respond quickly because of the inertia of the ocean, which is four kilometers deep, the ice sheets, which are a few kilometers thick. Uh, but uh, it does eventually respond. And we know that it's only partially responded to the, the gases we've already put in the atmosphere. There's about as much global warming that's still in the pipeline, even if we don't change the atmospheric composition any further. Uh, that's one simple uh, scientific fact. A second one is that the fossil fuel carbon that we put in the atmosphere stays in the climate system for millennia. There's absolutely no scientific disagreement about that. We, we know very well that it's going to st stay in the system. Uh, and, that's, and that's really the basis for Bill's uh, numbers that do the math. Um, so there, there's no a disagreement about that. And, you know, the funny thing is that the scientific community, although we have not really stood up clear, and clearly enough made the, the story clear that we can't, um, we can't continue to burn fossil fuels without creating a different planet with enormous consequences that we don't want to see. Yet we've reached a point where the relevant scientific community is actually saying, oh, it looks like it's too late. Let's start thinking of geoengineering. How, how are we going to fix it? You know, so we've gone from a place where people hadn't, scientists hadn't made clear to the public and the world leaders that there was a problem to a point where it's it's too late to really prevent uh, large climate change. Well, I don't think it's quite too late, and that's I I should really summarize this where the science is by saying what the story is in a paper which I've submitted for publication with about 15 co-authors, and it's. Um, it's called uh, Scientific Prescription for, uh, remember the exact title, but for uh, maintaining a climate change, uh, avoiding dangerous climate change for the sake of young people, future generations, and nature. And what we show, and the, the reason, the paper is the basis for legal actions that our children's trust is uh, filing against the federal government and against state governments. But it shows that if you wanted to get back to 350 ppm, you could still do it 
if we phased out emissions at 6% a year, which is very steep uh, reduction, and if we sucked 100 gigatons of carbon out of the atmosphere by improved agricultural and forestry practices. And that's uh, possible. Uh, so we're really at the last point where it's physically st still possible, but we're not starting down that kind of path. But if we went on a, as was mentioned in the film, if we went on a World War II uh, uh, crisis approach, we could reduce emissions that rapidly. So it, it's, uh, you know, we're at the last uh, point where we can still solve the problem without extreme geoengineering. Thanks, Jim. Um, and I want to pick up on a point that you made, which is around uh, young people, uh, because we obviously have a couple young people here um, who are really taking this crisis seriously. Um, and I wanted to ask Sophie a question around uh, working with the NYU Divest campaign. Um, and could you tell us a little bit about why you feel like this divestment movement is gaining steam among students around the country and why it seems like the strategy that people want to take? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's gained absolutely incredible momentum in a matter of months. Uh, when the Do the Math Tour launched, there were, I think, eight fossil fuel divestment campaigns. Um, at college campuses, and now there are almost more than 300. Um, and that, and Do the Math Tour was last fall. Um, so I think that there's something very immediate um, and very concrete about this call to action. Um, and I think that students are able to leverage their biggest power, um, which is being a member of a larger institution that really has control of a lot of money. Um, but at the same time, um, it's really about their futures and the fact that the fossil fuel industry is foreclosing on them having a stable future, um, which here at NYU, uh, our campaign has really made a point to tie that back in with the mission of the university, um, which is to support the students and to support them and prepare them for a future. And by investing in the very industry that's destroying the planet and destroying the future, um, that that's contradictory. Um, and it doesn't make sense to do all of these amazing things that, all of, that NYU is doing and that lots of schools are doing in sustainability um, on one hand and then profit off of these companies that are ruining all these things on the other hand. Um, so uh, I also think that people have a lot of different reasons for becoming a part of this movement. Um, but those reasons, I think, have been simmering for a long time. And now they're really coming to a boiling point uh, where people are feeling the urgency and being really motivated to take concrete action. Um, and I think that, like for me, uh, I think that climate change is a symptom of this much greater problem um, that we have with our natural world, um, the, our relationship, our society's relationship with the natural world and with each other. Um, and I think that one of the beautiful things about not, I mean, not so beautiful, but one of the important things about the climate crisis is that it puts a sense of urgency um, to really re-envision our society and the system um, by which these fossil fuel companies are profiting so heavily. So when we, when we talk about urgency, um, obviously one of the most urgent fights that, um, that has been joined so far has been this Keystone XL pipeline fight. Um, Dr. Hansen has spoken about it a lot, and, and many of us went down to Washington, D.C. for the February 18th uh, Forward on Climate rally that you saw some of the footage in the film from, um, including Hannah. 
and I wanted to ask you, Hannah, like what compelled you and your fellow students in droves to come down um, to that massive rally, and um, and what's next, do you think, for all those folks who have been fired up about the Keystone fight? Yeah, so the rally in Washington, D.C. was incredibly moving for myself and for 35,000 other people, I'm sure. Um, at Barnard and Columbia, um, where my campaign is located, um, we felt that there was a really tangible sense of enthusiasm um, around campus that, that we could tap into to see if people were interested in going down to the, the rally. And um, two of the members of my campaign, one of whom is here today, Joe, over in the corner, um, decided two days before the rally that they were going to book a charter bus to go down to Washington, D.C. And in fact, um, the next night, they had filled the bus with 60 people who wanted to go down to Washington and participate in this amazing event. Um, and when we all got to the rally, there was this huge sense of being pushed forward um, by the, the forcefulness of everybody walking on the streets of chanting out together. Um, and I know that that has motivated me um, and my colleagues in, in my campaign and around New York and around the country. Um, seeing posters of people who had come from Florida, who had come from Minnesota, who had come from Michigan, who had come from all different places to be here at this moment and to support the Obama administration in making the decision that is right for our country and right for our climate and for humanity in general um, was a really moving event. And, and I'm so glad that I could be there and that many of us were able to go. So, uh, Dr. Hansen, in 2011, you said that building the Keystone Pipeline would mean game over for the climate. And I wanted to ask you exactly what that meant to you and why you got involved with this fight in particular. Yeah, it had been clear, actually, for a long time. If we go all the way back to the paper I wrote in 1981 in Science, which was my first major paper, it was already on this topic. It was already clear then that we could not burn all the coal, and we could not burn the un so-called unconventional fossil fuels without causing an enormous climate change, which would mean eventually sea level rise of tens of meters and, and a different planet. And so that, and that's just become clearer and clearer as time has gone on. Uh, we have to leave the unconventional fossil fuels in the ground. They're much more carbon intensive. It makes no sense at all. The, the easily available oil and gas is enough to get us up to even the two degrees, which itself is, um, is going to have big climate effects. So it makes no sense. Uh, we're, if we burn those unconventional fossil fuels, we'll have to figure out a way to suck that CO2 out of the atmosphere, which is going to be incredibly expensive. So taking this step in the Keystone Pipeline is a huge step in the, the exactly the wrong direction, which it guarantees that our young people and future generations are going to have an enormous problem which they may not be able to solve. So it's, uh, it's, it's just so crazy, and yet we can't get the decision makers to understand that. Um, if we just put a moderate price on carbon, then tar sands would fall off the table very quickly, and we would not, not we, they would not be economic. They wouldn't, they wouldn't be used. Thanks, Jim. Um, Bill, I'm wondering if you can, um, this makes me think a lot about this idea of the keystone principle that, you know, you say that when you're in a hole you stop digging. Can you talk a little bit about what that means and um, what that means for the future of this movement? Sure. Um, what, uh, the phrase I think came from our friend and 350 board member, Casey Golden, out in Seattle, 
and he coined what he called the keystone principle. He said, we've got to stop building pieces of fixed infrastructure that lock us into, as Dr. Hansen was saying, a future where we keep burning this stuff. Uh, uh, it's, it, you know, we've got to be stopping what we're doing now, you know, figuring out how quickly to get off the sources we've already got, but it's complete folly to be adding new ones uh, along the way. And this is one of the reasons that the divestment fight is so important. If you're invested in the fossil fuel industry right now, uh, if your college is spending money, well, you're, the thing they're doing with the money that they raise in the capital markets is they're going and looking for more fossil fuel. Uh, Exxon spends $100 million a day doing that. And um, they're one company of 200 on the list of big uh, fossil fuel reserves that we talked about in, the, in this fight. Um, so we've, that's, you know, that's what we've got to turn around. We've got to get these guys working in the opposite direction. We've got to convince them that the jig is up in terms of going forward with fossil fuels, that the job now is to get off them fast. And if they want to make huge amounts of money going forward, uh, then they're going to have to become energy companies. I'll just add that um, Rex Tillerson from the CEO of Exxon, who we showed a lot of pictures of during that do the math thing, gave an interview uh, a, a couple of weeks ago that pretty much solidified all the reasons that we're doing this divestment thing. Charlie Rose asked him, and it was pretty much a softball question. He said, what's your philosophy? And I think he wanted him to give some philosophy. But instead, uh, Rex Tillerson just looked straight at the camera and said, my philosophy is to make money. So, uh, you know, full marks for honesty. Um, um, you know, we've got to make it so that uh, he can't make money doing what he's doing now, which is wrecking the planet. So, Sophie, I want to go, go to you for a second. Um, so th there's this perception that... Um, Bill referred to that the fossil fuel industry is just too powerful, too big to fail, um, and that a uh, movement like the divestment movement won't impact the fossil fuel companies in any significant way, um, you know, and that it might even do harm to an endowment or a pension fund if they did divest. Um, so what would you say in response to that? Yeah, um, it comes up a lot um, because the fossil fuel industry is you know, the most profitable industry since the history of money. And like Bill always says and says in the tour, um, it's because they cheat and they pollute for free. Um, but divesting from fossil fuels does not mean a loss in profit necessarily um, and a rise in tuition and, you know, the, the slippery slope argument that people come up with. Um, one of, so NYU Divest had their first meeting with um, the NYU administration just this past Wednesday, which was really exciting. And, <laughs> and uh, what I explained to the CFO of NYU, <laughs> um, um, is that one of, you know, I said, you know, clearly I'm not the financial expert in the room, but one of the most wonderful things about being part of this na national movement that's grown so much momentum is that a lot of experts in the socially responsible investment field and a lot of financial experts have come forward to say and demonstrate that it is feasible um, to divest from fossil fuels and it does not mean that, that the endowment has to take a, a loss in returns. Um, and there was a, you know, there are lots of studies now that are showing this. So the Aperio group came out with a study recently that showed um, the, that the loss on, re loss on return would be close to none. Um, Tom Steyer, you know, who's, who's a big hedge fund, Robert's former back. hedge fund manager, what, sorry? He's a really rich guy. Yeah, <laughs> he's, a, he's a really rich guy, and he, you know, he does this for a living, and he managed billions of dollars. Um, has come forward and said that this is not, not only is this 
not going to be a loss, but it actually could be smarter, um, that this is a smart investment strategy. Um, because the reality is that if we're going to stay below this two degree warming, 80% of the assets that these companies are valued at their reserves, 80% of their reserves cannot come out of the ground. Um, and so, you know, people are referring to the Carbon Tracker Institute that did this math ref is referring to it as, you know, this carbon bubble, very similar to the housing bubble. And, you know, Tom St as Tom Steyer likes to say, no one's going to come out on top when the bubble bursts. Um, and it's, we, it's almost as if we're giving, you know, the scientists and the, the, you know, the people of these academic institutions are giving their universities a heads up on what's to come. Um, and so, so I really think that demonstrating that um, is important, that this is actually a, the, the, both the morally right thing to do and, and the smart thing to do. And we, we actually happen to have Mark and Luke from the Carbon Dracker Initiative here with us in the front row. So if you have questions for them about the carbon bubble, they're waving their hands. Um, so Hannah, I wanted to switch gears here for a second. And um, thinking about the film, one of the things that uh, we saw at the Forward on Climate rally is that um, it, th this movement is actually getting a lot more diverse. Right? There's young people, there's even high school students, there's folks from indigenous communities um, in Canada, there's people who are impacted by Hurricane Sandy from the Rockaways, um, and they're joining hands with um, environmentalists who have been doing a lot of this work for many, many years. Um, but students in particular are on the forefront of this new, envisioning that what this new climate justice movement might look like. Um, and so, you know, to you, to students, what, you know, who would be part of it? What would it feel like and what would we be, we'd be asking for? Yeah, so something that um, Sophie touched on earlier was, was that there, there's a definite reason why we're all sitting here today. Um, and clearly something has grabbed all of us very, very strongly. Um, this great sense of urgency that we're all feeling about climate change and what needs to be done and what must be done to, to combat um, the destruction of our environment. Um, and, and there's this great sense of enthusiasm that we have to tap into. Um, and most of that, or, or much of it, is formed by the over 300 campaigns that have formed on, on college campuses. Um, and I think that's really due to the fact that we are the ones set to inherit this, this planet. Um, our future is, is being put into the hands of people who clearly don't care about how the environment is going to be in the, in the next 30, 40, 50 years. Um, and that's our reality, that's our future. And so what I see uh, very clearly is um, a sense of student power that's starting to form. Um, it's, it's very tangible. And, and right now, um, students are working hand in hand with frontline communities, people whose lives are, are being directly impacted by um, the, the fossil fuel industry and its, its strategies to extract fuels um, and resources from our planet. Um, and so I, I firmly believe that standing in solidarity with these communities and diversifying the environmental movement as we see it today, um, you know, working in tandem with this concept of student power, um, at NYU Divest and at Barnard Columbia Divest, we are right now um, forming a coalition of New York City divestment campaigns um, in the hopes of creating a network, um, a regional, you know, source of power that we can draw from as we, yeah, yeah, right? Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, as, as we look to... Um, just, just ramp up this energy that, that is so strong and I can feel it in this room and I, I feel it when I'm in meetings and conferences and panels um, and it's incredibly exciting. Um, and we, we saw in the movie um, Crystal Lehman who is a representative from the Beaver Cree um, First Nation in Canada who 
is seeing her lands um, being torn apart by the tar sands um, actions going on there. Um, we, we heard from her at um, a convergence of over 75 student campaigns that met at Swarthmore College um, this past uh, February. And um, what she experienced um, in a meeting with the Swarthmore Board of Trustees um, while asking them to divest their endowment from the fossil fuel industry, um, she told them her story and the story of her people and the story of her land. And the response from the Board of Trustees was that, well, we've all heard these stories and this is just another one. Yeah. Um, so when you ask me, what are we asking for? I respond by saying, we're not asking, we are demanding the right, yeah. We're demanding the right to our planet back, to our future back. We're demanding that we be regarded as fellow human beings, all sharing this planet and sharing the environment. Thank you. So, Dr. Hansen, you've joined civil disobedience efforts in the past around mountaintop removal, coal mining, uh, around Keystone XL pipeline. Um, what compelled you to take those actions and, and what do you think the role of escalated action is in the climate movement? Well, I, I was compelled that the first, the first arrest was a mountaintop removal at Coal River Mountain where Larry Gibson, I'd met Larry Gibson and realized this is just doubly so stupid because you not only are we creating this climate problem for young people, but also just the local effects. Uh, the life expectancy of the people in that region is significantly less than, than the rest of the country because of the pollution. The groundwater was polluted. So it was just, so these uh, demonstrations are to draw attention to uh, what is really injustices and particularly injustice to young people. Uh, but we have to go beyond that. I mean, that drawing attention is a first step, but we actually have to have the solutions. And, and that's why I am uh, particularly trying to get people to understand that a simple, honest, rising fee collected from fossil fuel companies at the domestic mine or port of entry is, a, is, a, is, is essential. Without that, the fossil fuels will continue to be the cheapest energy as they don't pay for their cost to society. So we have to get the public to understand that that is needed and we have to put pressure on the political system because it won't happen without the public putting the pressure on because Washington and the other capitals are so influenced by fossil fuel money that they ignore what is in the public's interest unless, unless we can really make the story clear. And, I, and frankly, you know, I, I say that the public will not allow <clears throat> a carbon fee unless the money goes to the public. So I say the money that's collected from the fossil fuel companies should be distributed uniformly to the public. In, in, which, in which case, 60% of the public will get more in this... Uh, dividend, then they pay an increased prices. And there would be a very strong incentive for them, the public, to make decisions that minimize their fossil fuel use. And there will be a very strong incentive for entrepreneurs to develop carbon-free uh, and low-carbon energies and energy efficiency. And unless, we, unless that happens, we can't solve the problem. We, we, it's not enough, even, even um, as important as it is that divestiture will not by itself solve the problem. We ha actually have to have to drive the economy. And, and 
this sort of approach is actually something that conservatives should uh, be in favor of. And that's why I'm particularly targeting uh, thinking conservatives, not uh, because I think it has the best chance of happening soon if we can get some leading conservatives to endorse that idea. And, and I, you may have noticed that George Schultz uh, in the last couple of weeks wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal in which he endorsed exactly that approach. Uh, and, 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 and he had a co-author, uh, a Nobel Prize winning economist, because this, this is smart economics. This is the way you need to drive the system in order to move us uh, off of fossil fuels. So uh, anyway, that I think is the key uh, to the, the eventual solution to the problem. Well, we have to get the public to understand that because unless the public puts some pressure, the politicians uh, don't seem to want to, uh, to do that. Thanks. Can I speak to that for a second yeah, really quick? Um, just like, I want to share a story really quick from the meeting we had um, this past Wednesday with our administrators that I think has to do with this, um, because uh, this kind of pressure that, that we need to start putting um, on the public pressure to, to make these political actions happen. Um, and, you know, divestment is one of those pressures. And so we were, we were talking to the VP of NYU, and he, and he was like, you know, you're doing great things, argument accepted. Like, yeah, climate change. Um, but I don't think, you know, he said, I don't think divestment is the answer to it, and I think that your efforts are best directed towards, you know, encouraging a carbon tax. And we didn't say this, um, but what we should have said is, well, you sure as hell should hope that you get your money out of fossil fuels um, by the time we encourage a carbon tax. Um, so I think that, the, you know, it, and what I said in the film um, briefly, I don't know if you guys caught it, um, and I was actually wearing the same scarf, I just realized, but... Um, uh, was that I think that solving this problem is not a silver, like there's no silver bullet. Um, and this is not my words, this is um, from a really awesome um, environmental psychologist that I saw speak. Uh, and she said uh, that instead it's a silver buckshot. And the way a buckshot works is that it's a bunch of little bullets that makes an impact. So I think that divestment is one of those things, and a carbon tax is, you know, one of those culminating things that all of these, you know, all of these buckshot bullets are going to lead up to to solve the problem. So. I just want to say that. I just, I, can I add to this for a second, Phil, too? Because I think this is so right. Look, uh, you know, I wrote the first book about all this 25 years ago, back when Jim was giving his first testimony in Congress about all this, and back before the other members of our panel were born, okay? And there's never been any doubt really about the science or really about the solutions that we have to make these guys pay for the damage that they're doing. And if, if we did, we'd begin to get somewhere. So Jim's right as he's been right for a very long time about this fee and dividend stuff, and we keep fighting for it. I got to be there in uh, the Senate in February when our my Senator Bernie Sanders introduced what's a pretty good bill that starts down this path and so on and so forth. Our trouble is never been that we lost the argument. Our problem has always been that we lost the fight. And the reason we lost the fight is the fossil fuel industry has too much power. So when the Board of Trustees says, oh, you should go fight for you know, something on Capitol Hill instead of bothering us, 
it's such baloney. The, um, the, the answer is, you know, if you invested in Chevron, you helped Chevron give a $2 million gift two weeks before the last election, the biggest corporate campaign donation since Citizens United. And it was aimed at making sure that nothing would ever happen in Washington. It was aimed at making sure that this fight you want us supposedly to go have is impossible to win. So we've got to weaken the power of that industry. We've got to do all the other things that Jim talks about and everybody else talks about. But the thing that's happening in the divestment front finally is that for the first time, we're taking on this power head on. We're playing offense against them and we're starting to cut their power. In the last couple of months, there have been two studies from Citigroup and HSBC and both of them showed that if we took seriously even the compromised and weak two degree target uh, uh, for temperature rise, that it would cut their valuations in half. That means that there are now trillions of dollars at risk in pension funds and college endowments and things from this carbon bus bubble bursting. We're beginning to put real and intense pressure on them because of that. And that kind of pressure eventually will pay off in their weakened ability to wreck policy in Washington and almost every other capital on earth. So the fight you guys are fighting, the front you've opened on college campuses is absolutely crucial to getting done what Jim has been saying for a very long time needs to get done. So we, we, we've got time for uh, one more question. I've got it here on this index card, this very secret index card. Um, and it's for Bill, actually. Um, and it's uh, around the fact that there are more people involved with this movement than ever before, um, both here in the US. Um, and wondering what your thoughts are on next steps for this movement and how we build it even larger so we can achieve those government actions. So here's the really good news. And I tried to write about it again in Rolling Stone a couple of weeks ago. And I, you know, one of the, since I'm basically a writer, um, one of the few powers of writers is they get to sort of try to give names to things. And the name that I, I, seems to me appropriate for all our work together is a kind of fossil fuel resistance. And it's been amazing to watch it coming up from everywhere. And we see it, you know, we see it in the big environmental groups, which are becoming more and more charged up. The Sierra Club, which has been fighting coal for a long time and now is engaging in civil disobedience across a, a, a wide spectrum, the NRDC who's been helping so hard in the Keystone fight. But the environmental movement's no longer just big Washington-based environmental organizations. It's mostly people coming up from everywhere. Uh, 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 we're led by frontline communities. We're led by the indigenous, by the oldest inhabitants of this continent who have been had to watch for the last 500 years as it's gotten trashed and uh, and have been telling us it's getting trashed and now they're telling us louder than ever and completely amazing to watch the indigenous environmental network and all their allies idle no more in Canada everybody coming together to watch the EJ community that's been fighting so hard and city after city to block bad refineries and you know all coal-fired power plants uh, to see that just keeping ramp up to watch farmers and ranchers along the route of the Keystone Pipeline, or to watch all those people in New England stopping them from putting tar sands pipeline uh, uh, across northern New England. There are a thousand other examples of people fighting coal ports out west. So, this summer, if you don't mind, please, there'll be details to come, but the last 10 days of July are statistically the hottest 10 days of the year. Uh, uh, most years. And we're going to try and make them politically the hottest 10 days of the year, too. Gonna, uh, we're going to do lots and lots of people. What we're, we're going to do, people are already planning in their local communities, lots and lots of good distributed actions, things going on, and we're going to try and give them, knit them together. Uh, give them a kind of common national profile so the fossil fuel industry can really see who their adversaries are, so they can understand that there's a lot of us and they're going to have to deal with us. So mark those days aside. Some of you might want to put 
a dollar or two a week out of, you know, beer money or whatever aside for a kind of bail fund or something. Um, and just keep your eye out for details to come, okay? Because it's going to be um, um, important, collaborative, beautiful. On we go. Uh, 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 on we go, and let's hope we can do it quickly enough to catch up with the physics that Dr. Hansen has described tonight and described for the last 40 years in his invaluable service to science and, and, and to our planet. Thank you, Bill. So the reason we did this panel discussion after the film is not to talk at you for an hour but to actually let you all have conversations about what those strategies are that are gonna take us forward to help build this movement, to build those relationships. Um, those of you who are watching at home, um, you probably have access to the discussion guide. Now would be a good time to check that out at 350.org slash math. Um, and for those of you in the room, um, after we all thank the new school for hosting us and our panelists in a second, um, turn to somebody next to you who you don't know. Introduce yourself and um, talk about, ask them what they're gonna be doing this summer uh, during those 10 days of July. Um, so let's give our panelists a round of applause. Thanks to the folks at the New School and Jared and Kelly and their crew at PF Pictures for putting the film together. And thank you all for coming. <laughs>